On my desk, I have a Mac Studio with an M2 Ultra chip and 128 gigs of RAM. This is effectively the best Mac you can buy right now, sure. The Mac Pro is out there, we'll talk about it later. But you're gonna get all the performance you could hope for in this thing, so I wanna see what can it do. Apple made some bold claims, especially for creative professionals like myself, so I'm gonna test it out in a lot of the apps that I use on a regular basis, see how it performs, especially next to the M2 Max. I started out pretty basic by looking at some speed tests. Typically, I don't like to worry too much about benchmarks. My focus is on real world applications, so I'm not running synthetic benchmarks, I'm just timing regular world use cases. So running Blackmagic speed test was the one exception. And what I found that was interesting is the M2 Max and the M2 Ultra have very similar disk speeds, but the M1 Ultra was noticeably slower. They've made a nice bump here to disk speeds, which I didn't notice in the keynote. One hardware advantage the Mac Studio has over the Mac Pro is a built-in SD card reader. I was curious if this was any faster than in the M1 Ultra. The read and write speeds seem to be the same. No upgrade there, which is fine. It is a pretty effective card reader. But now let's run some real tests. Keep in mind, I've got QuickTime recording my screen the whole time, so that does have somewhat of an impact. It takes a bit of the processing power in the background. I'm running the latest versions of all of this software, testing it on both computers. So in Final Cut Pro, I loaded in a recent project. This is pretty complicated. It is my review of the Lumix S5 II and the S5-2X. It has tons of different file formats, lots of color grading. It's long. So first of all, just the experience of going through and editing. That's actually the most important performance to me and it's incredibly performant. One thing I love is ever since the M2 upgrades, I was able to turn off any sort of pre-rendering so I don't have background rendering on. Everything is happening in real time. I'm previewing things at better quality. I used to have to do it at better performance. I'm just able to move through everything really quickly. It never slows down, including when I use plugins. So for example, this is Motion VFX. This one's in their music video pack and it's zoom in. So you can just have that effect of quickly zoom Zooming in, very easy to use. They are all fast loading, it never slows down, even if I start to stack them. Let's try that. Do some 4K ProRes clips. Let's see what I can add on top. How about a lens flare? Still good. Maybe some film grain. All right, still smooth. Anamorphic lens, prism effect, a vintage look. This is going overboard, but it's still all working. So you used to really have to worry about how many layers you'd stack. On the M2 Ultra, it just keeps going. If you wanna use any of these, head to the link below. They put together a landing page of some of my favorite packs that I use all the time. Now, like I say, being able to move through this quickly is the most important thing, but it's easier to benchmark export times. So I exported these as H.264 videos, something that you'd typically use to publish on the web. This project, which is over 16 minutes long of 4K footage, took four minutes and 47 seconds on the M2 Max. And on the M2 Ultra, it took three minutes, 11 seconds. That's a huge gain. That is much faster, especially in the same generation of chip. If you don't already know, the M2 Ultra is two fused together M2 Max chips. Now, something I didn't realize during the keynote, but found out afterwards is that with the M1 Ultra, even though there were two media engines, they were only able to operate on two different videos at the same time. So when you export, those two media engines couldn't work together on one video. Now they can. So that's part of the reason we're seeing these big bumps in speeds. It's more than the CPU and GPU speed bumps combined. It's that the two media engines can now both focus on one export. And this doesn't only apply to Final Cut, DaVinci Resolve, Premiere are gonna get these advantages as well. This project is the stress test that I created a few years ago, a bunch of the footage. The red 6K is from Cam Mackey. And generally I can scrub through it, I can play through it and everything's fine, that's great to see. Here's the big crazy stress test. So in my M1 review last year, it actually couldn't handle this. So right now the denoise layer is turned off and it's playing back smoothly at 24 frames per second, no dropped frames, everything's looking good. But what happened on the M1 Ultra is that as soon as I turned that on, so we're dropping some frames here, definitely can't quite play back denoised footage it would visibly drop frames. You could see it slowing down. It couldn't play back at a full 24. Well, I'm glad to report now, if I turn on denoise, you can see my settings down here, the same as last year. It now plays back smoothly at 24 frames per second. This is great news. I mean, uh, denoise was always something that works incredibly well in Resolve, but it would slow things down so much that it was a big decision to use it on your computer. Now, if you're running an M2 Ultra Mac Studio, 
you can do it, no drop frames. Then this is also some Canon RAW 8K footage. There's a big mix of stuff in here, but I wanted to see how does it export compared to the M2 Max. The Max took 31 seconds, while the Ultra was 26. Not that same huge jump we saw in Final Cut. This is also a more simplified project, so I'm not sure if it's entirely because of the longer timelines. I have done a test comparing the export times of Final Cut, Resolve, and Premiere. So if you're curious about like the relative speed differences, you can watch that whole video or I can spoil it a little bit and say that Resolve and Final Cut are generally the same. So I'm a little surprised to see that you don't get that same speed advantage. Maybe it's something about my test, I'm not sure. But I do have some bad news. Even though Premiere Pro has been getting optimized, it's still much slower than the others. So I have basically that same footage in a very similar timeline. It plays back smoothly, I'm able to work through it. Let's make sure I'm playing back at full. Yeah, the 6K is good. The 8K looks good. Red, raw, 6K, all of it plays smoothly. You're gonna be able to work on the footage, that's no issue. The export times, well, they were a lot slower than the other software, let me tell you. On the M2 Max, it took four minutes and 50 seconds, but on the M2 Ultra, it took three minutes and 13 seconds, so much faster on the Ultra than the Max, but much slower in Premiere than it was in Resolve or Final Cut. Now, I know this video is about the Mac Studio, but we need to spend some time talking about the Mac Pro. So if you saw in the keynote, it's in the exact same enclosure as it was before, which is beautiful. I loved it when I reviewed it. And don't get me wrong, I would still love to be working with a Mac Pro, but this is now for a much smaller, more specific audience with a much bigger budget. Because all you can do is use these internal slots to expand either IO devices or sound cards or storage, but you can't expand GPU or RAM. And most people really don't need to because like I said, you're gonna get the exact same performance in this Mac Studio as in the Mac Pro. I still wanna think that I could justify having a computer like this, but the truth is it is now targeted at an audience that is big Hollywood studio, not even smaller commercial productions. We just don't need it. Unless you have a lot of devices running in and out of the back of your computer, the Mac Studio is gonna be able to perform exactly the same. And here's my theory. It's strange that it took so long for Apple to announce the same computer. I think they might've been working on developing something different, some kind of bigger announcement that we never saw, but maybe we still could. It's, it's just weird to me. I, I get why this is released and I get who it's for and why they would need it, but I don't know why it took so long to announce something that is so similar to what we had before. Ever since the Apple Silicon Macs, I've been talking about that it's harder to benchmark these because they just run so fast that I don't slow them down. But fortunately, AI has given us some ways to push these computers further. So for example, the new beta of Photoshop has built-in generative AI. If I want to expand this canvas, which this is a real photo, there is no AI in this photo at the moment, but maybe I want to fill it out a little bit more. I can select the regions of the image that I want to add onto, and I know it is hard to believe looking at this that it's real, but I'll show you video proof later. And the easiest way to do it is just say generative fill and let Photoshop do its thing. So this is actually pretty fast. Um, the thing is that as you work with Photoshop, typically you need to do this multiple times. Only doing it once in a large selection like this actually produces more messy results. So, <laughs> wow, some of those birds went crazy. Uh, let's see, did any of these look realistic? I think the second one is the closest to being realistic, but you can see these birds are super confused and it's also lower resolution. The city looks kind of bad. The way that you really need to do this is one section at a time. So maybe you would select a big portion of the sky and you would say generative fill, seagulls flying in the sky. In the smaller area you do at a time, it spends more time on that region and does a better job. So you might have to do this over and over again in an image. So as we wait for those results, let's look at the comparison on the M2 Max. It took 13 seconds and on the M2 Ultra, it also took 13 seconds. There seems to be no difference. And that's a fun surprise. I guess I selected things in a wrong way. But here, let's let this go a little more in more specific regions. And after spending more time on it, we can go from an impressive image to a unbelievable kind of fake looking image. <laughs> Maybe AI still has some work to do. Another thing I've been saying about Apple Silicon is all of it is pretty much good enough for any photography use at this point. Um, there are some new AI use cases. For example, in Lightroom, you can now do sky selections. So having that work faster is helpful. I've been doing it very often. You can also do subject selections. So if I want to just select Anya, 
I can either select all of her, just certain parts of her body, but it's really quick at discerning those differences, and then you can just apply selective adjustments as you see fit. Now the computers have all this headroom, I did find some applications that can make them sweat, and those come from Topaz Labs. They are using AI to do a lot of things. For example, you can massively upsample your image and it does a really good job. Same with noise removal, all of this stuff, but it takes a little while. So if we're just applying this to a single image, it's basically the same speed of 24 seconds between the M2 Ultra and the M2 Max. But if you really wanna push it, you've gotta use Topaz Video. So I was using this video of Anya again on the same rooftop, which is, like I said, totally real. So she's just running in slow motion towards these birds, but I can use AI to slow that down. So what I wanna do is go four times slower, and this will slow down any computer. You can also do things like motion de-blur. Let's just do that frame interpolation. I hit export and wait. In the Mac Studio, there's a fan inside that I think it's always running and you don't hear it kick in even when it's working hard. But this is enough to make the M2 Max MacBook Pro kick into overdrive. Listen to these fans. Last time I had Jonathan Morrison on the podcast, we talked about the importance of headroom on professional machines. If you're operating at the, the top percent and there's nowhere else to go, like that's not a good place to be. For me, the way I can assess something is how much does it get out of my way? And this is what it's for. We didn't have these use cases just a couple of years ago, but when you have headroom, it means you can push it further. You can do things you didn't anticipate or you filmed 4K 60 and you want it to be slower and you don't have to wait as long. The M2 Max took 15 minutes and two seconds to process this clip. Meanwhile, the M2 Ultra took six minutes and 26 seconds. That's a huge difference. An update. I can hear the fan on the M2 Ultra now too. It is spinning, but it's super quiet. I'll have to turn up the volume. These machines are getting crazy good. And a few more things just about the form factor of the Mac Studio, which I said this last year, but I love it. I mean, it's kind of a return to the Mac Cube from many, many years ago, and it's just efficient and fits well. I still wish we had a 27 inch iMac, I am thinking that this is their replacement for it. I don't know if they plan on ever doing it again because pairing the Mac Studio with the Studio Display works really well and it's a lot more adaptable. You can replace the computer, keep the display because displays typically last much longer than the computers you're pairing with them. I love having so many IO ports, even just having the USB available on the front really helps out a lot of the time. Like I said, that SD card reader comes in clutch. At this point, there's not that much more I could hope for from the Mac Studio. It's doing great. If you're like me, you still have a deep desire for the bigger tower like a Mac Pro, but just the truth is these processors have gotten so much better that that expandability isn't really required anymore. There are things still missing though, like a GPU story. If you're training AI models, which I'm not, but let's say you are, you can't expand GPUs. So I still wanna see Apple be able to serve that market someday. But right now the Mac Studio meets all my needs and probably yours too. If you wanna know more about it, you should subscribe to the channel or the podcast where I go into way more depth. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video.